and welcome back to another episode of The Practice Odyssey. My name's Alex. And I'm Jen. And if you're new here, The Practice Odyssey is a lively discussion every fortnight about a new method of improving our musical practice uh, for flutists in general, but it also applies to many other instruments. And let you know, the listeners, if it did indeed change our lives for the better, make us professional, amazing musicians, or did it ruin us for life? (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, uh, if you're new to this season, this is our season six season of why, which Mm. means we are practicing exclusively the beautiful omnibus that is Trevor Wise. Uh, all six books in there. We've made it already through books one to three. So if you would like to hear about tone or technique or articulation, please go back a few episodes and you can catch up with us. And then, Jen, what did we do for the past two weeks? So for the past two weeks, um, because the omnibus is just so large, um, we've, we've put two two books together for this past four night. We decided to do... Um, his book on intonation and his book mm-hmm. on breathing and scales. Um, just because the intonation and vibrato was, too and vibrato, yes. Um, so <laughs> because the intonation and vibrato, it's quite succinct. So it's quite a it's quite a long mm-hmm. title. We've done we've done four things. So we've done what is it? Intonation and vibrato, <laughs> breathing and scales. So it's just all happening this past just don't fortnight. Let the- titles fool you listeners even though the titles for the books are long the books themselves are short which is why we chose these to put together yes <laughs> even though yep, yep, it's yep. a pain to make the thumbnail for this Although, episode as but a, <laughs> as a spoiler i did um think that the books were short and then yeah <laughs> yeah yes uh, uh yes yes Mm. Anyway, <laughs> this, this is why you never judge a book by its cover. On that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh wow. Or by its length. Another oh cracker gosh. of a fortnight, that's for sure. Um, yes. Yeah. So those are the two books which we're doing this week. First, normally you give a spiel about who wrote the book, but because we're doing a whole season on just the one omnibus. Um, we've foregone doing the biography of Trevor White every episode. Instead, we're finding out fun facts uh, about <laughs> about yes. Trevor White. Um, and uh, last week, Alex really raised the bar with her fun facts. Um, so oh, I thank you. Uh, did not meet yes, it this week. Yes, the secret method <laughs> <laughs> uh, that instead, I'd never heard of. <laughs> yeah, I know the secret secret book of the secrets. So my fun fact this week is actually on why he wrote the omnibus, <gasps> oh. um, which is down the back of one of the books. He mm-hmm. says, I was studying with Marcel Moyes at his master class in Switzerland, an event I attended every summer for 12 years. One morning I was woken up by a student in the next room of our hotel at about 7 a.m. He was practising Moyes' De La Sonorité on our shared balcony. He had a poor tone the ends of the notes went flat. The quality of tone was wrong. It was awful. I asked him what he was doing. The tone exercise from Moyes, he answered, proudly waving the book at me. He seemed to think that the possession of the book and the regular performance of the exercise was all that was needed to acquire a good tone. That was the moment I decided to write a book on tone which could be easily understood by everyone. But then what about technique too? Anyway, so that's what Trevor Wise said. I was like, oh man, brutal. I wonder if that person knows <laughs> i know <laughs> that, that he that been, was the impetus <laughs> i know he's been immortalized in the omnibus anyway if you're listening please write to us we will if you know that it is you, you yeah you shared a balcony with trevor y and <laughs> yes thank you yes. <laughs> he massively critiqued <laughs> your your practicing actually that would be really oh, intense i have to say to be sh- to know that you're sharing a a room where someone who's really really good can yes practice yeah. oh my gosh he's just right over there <laughs> oh and, he, and then you're like hey i'm gonna practice every day to get better I know. and i'm gonna show him <laughs> 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 oh, oh okay. yes flute players i guess now i better break down the books so in this book breathing uh, intonation and vibrato volume four 
uh, he talk, he basically spends the first half of it talking about um, intonation and equal temperament and um, how the flute is built to be in tune, how this can affect our playing mm-hmm. uh, because we're playing in equal temperament instead of just temperament. Um, yeah. After he talks a lot about flute's foibles in terms of equal temperament <laughs> and just temperament, he goes into vibrato uh, and exercises about how to make your vibrato more beautiful. And then he finishes up the book with exercises on or 24 studies on intonation, where he's got a study for each different uh, scale um, mm-hmm. on the flute, both low and high register. And then he finishes off with orchestral excerpts um, and particularly challenging ones for intonation very exposed so that's uh the basic breakdown of intonation and vibrato uh breathing and scales is basically broken into six sections he's got breathing at the beginning hooray we just get that done then he's got a section (laughs) on then the middle section is taken up with all different sorts of scales and arpeggios he finishes off with a little with two little sections on improvisation and suggestions for playing from memory so that's the breakdown of the books and basically what they contain yeah now that I think about it there's a lot in these books um (laughs) yes so Alex how did how did you go about tackling this the uh hefty volume of uh knowledge and information (laughs) in these two books oh (laughs) my goodness one like (laughs) yes so back when we started this podcast season I looked a little bit at each book because I knew that my time also this like this part of the year is usually a little crazy and chaotic getting everything set up like and especially because COVID's going down like rehearsals are starting to meet back up and everything Mm. so I figured okay I needed to plan and I did notice that like okay for book four there is a lot there's not so much to do with just playing it's a lot of reading and Mm. understanding how mm-hmm. intonation on the flute works, just like you were saying in your intro. And so, um, yeah, the first, so for the first week, I kind of just focused on reading it every single night. That was kind oh, of yeah. my goal because, you know, we were doing the two books together and mm-hmm. I, I really wanted to kind of see how he approached teaching this kind of, um, like how do he teaches intonation? Like, cause it's always an interesting topic with students, you know, whenever you're beginning, like, how do you tell them like, yeah, that that's not correct. You need like, that's flat. You say that's flat to a new student. They're like, Hey, like, is it like, <laughs> what? like literally flat? <laughs> like this is sharp. No, it's not. I didn't cut myself, you know? So it can be like starting there. How do you mm. explain these kinds of concepts? Like, does it sound mm. wrong? Yes. But how can we fix it? And first off, why does it sound wrong? What is the problem? Mm. But um, but yeah, so for the first week, I kind of just read through book four. And Mm. I have to say, like he also mentioned, you know, like especially in the foreword, he's already mentioned practice book one and like how it it relates to that. So uh, if you have not worked on practice book one, um, he references a lot of stuff in here that is in there. I think you could make it work without it, but Mm. he does do that. And he does say, like, you know, (laughs) you need a well-tuned piano as well to work through this book, which I Uh, I loved because, yeah, you don't want an out-of-tune piano. Out-of-tune piano. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) That would not be good. And, yeah, again, we get a lot of, like, nice little phrases from him. Like, um, Mm. he says, like, you know, to develop your musical ear to make sure things sound nice and correct Mm. as in Mm. with regards to tone and like if it's the right intonation (laughs) it does not come easily which I think is always important to point out even people who make it look easy easy have to hone it and he says and they requires or needs frequent refreshment (laughs) like you always need to be you know just like your crunches and your physical exercise you have to hone Mm. your ears every day like I know Like my ears between like right now where I'm not actively prepping for an audition at this moment versus when I'm prepping for an audition, certain recordings I cannot listen to because like bits of it are so out of tune. And Mm. then when I'm out of audition season, it doesn't bug me because I'm like, oh, yeah, Yeah. whatever. But like because my ears are kind of like out of shape again, you know? 
Yeah, so, yeah. more forgiving. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I have to say, like, I, I really, he, he approaches teaching intonation, like first mm. starting at the piano and teaching how to hear the harmonic series. And I thought that was a really effective way to approach it. So mm. I was really, like, I, I sat down at my piano and I did a bunch of his little exercises he does at the beginning, just like you would with a student. But I, I thought it was quite... Yeah, quite effective how he explains everything. And he uses mm. really simple terminology where you don't need an advanced degree to understand what's <laughs> going physics, on here. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which sometimes they, the methods can get a little deep into the science part, which for us, you know, as people who study music professionally, like we have masters, it's not that big of a deal for us. But mm. for somebody approaching this from a very... A uh, novice level that would like be really a tricky. So, yeah, yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> like a five-year-old, because there are five-year-old flute players, and they can learn yeah. how to play in tune without having a science degree. But I'd have to say my favorite part of book four, just up to the trios, where he has you doing the little trios for two flutes, and I had fun kind of like recording myself playing and then playing with it to see if it would also be effective for mm. hearing the different notes that he was discussing. Um, so that's as far as I got in week one for book four. Um, but I, I would say my favorite bit was um, page 129. But he basically mm. gives like how to adjust if you're playing with individuals, how high or low you need to adjust your playing so that you sound in tune. And this is yeah. something I didn't really hear outside of my education in Texas. Like in Texas, it was really big. Like, okay, you know, we're playing a major second here. So, you know, make sure that you adjust it plus two. You're like you have to play yeah. it a little sharper and yeah. then you're in tune. Like not both of you, yeah. but like one person needs to adjust plus two. So yeah. I, and that was one thing that was always like, oh, okay. Like major third minus seven, perfect fourth minus one. And he actually has that all written down here, yeah. which I thought was super handy. Cause you know, as players, you could easily be like, well, both of our tuners say that we're playing in tune. <laughs> Why yeah, does it sound it's... like really bad? And that's because, yeah. oh, you're playing this interval. And for this interval, because of the harmonics and how they're built, you need to adjust. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. um, so I, I would say around that page, it starts to get a little more complicated, but he breaks it down up to there really easily. And for people mm. who are playing with others and want to make sure you're in tune, this is like a, a lovely little cheat sheet. And yeah. But yeah, that's all I did for the first week. So I didn't get too far into it, but I also wanted to spend a lot of time on like how he was teaching it and how he approached it just so I could kind of get an idea of like, oh yeah, like how does, mm. how do other people teach it? Cause I don't know, have we done a method where they've talked exclusively about intonation and how to like build your intonation practice before? Mm, I, don't I don't know, know if, if we, we have. have. Not, like tone, yes, absolutely tone. Yeah. And usually intonation is a part of that, but usually they just say like, oh, make sure it's in tune. <laughs> yeah, and you're Which, just kind of expected to know that it is mm-hmm. in tune yeah yeah it's yeah exactly. it is interesting oh like well I don't know sometimes you get told some kind of warning things like your c sharps are always going to be very sharp right. or watch for your low register because they're going to be flat or watch out for your mm-hmm. high register notes because they're going to be sharp so you kind of got a vague idea of what you need to be looking out for and what to kind of anticipate but in terms of detail you're right mm-hmm. not not a huge amount gets. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. I, yeah. It was. Oh. I, I like that he approaches it. I'm sorry, mm. probably verdict territory. But and yeah, it was really interesting because he also brings up, you know, equal versus just temperament, which mm-hmm. I don't think I learned about until much later in my flute. Uh, career mm. not career like when I was still in high school I was introduced mm. to like when you start learning about baroque music then you learn about just versus equal but um <laughs> but yeah <laughs> sorry also my, my my week one's taking super long I just <laughs> <laughs> we're like at 30 minutes oh no um so yeah so I did that for the first week I'm so sorry and then I did book five too surprisingly um Way. which yeah <laughs> yes I found it super odd for him to start Okay, so he does a section on breathing, which I'm like, yes, uh, yay, finally breathing. Makes yes. sense in big picture omnibus. It goes along with tone. Mm-hmm, it, interesting mm-hmm. that he chose it to go after tone. But then mm. the first example he gives Jen in the book oh my gosh, for tone is, is for a fantasy. What? Oh, I know. Like, is this a, is this a good example of, like, 
something where you do need good breath control and the style in which you breathe is also important. Absolutely. Like it is, that's yep. why they choose it for lots of auditions. Yep. But yep. to like, if, if you were just beginning on the flute, <laughs> and you're, like, you're like, yeah, I want to improve my breathing. And then you're hopped into foray. I mean, the fantasy. I would be I very mean, intimidated. Fair, he's, he's done the opening section, which, you know, it doesn't go crazy high. And it's pretty no, of slow course not. and a lot of scale. It is. But, yeah, I know what you mean. It's, like, pretty... Well, considering that all of his other examples up till now when he's used yeah. them have been very, very accessible. Yes, um, like, it's very yeah. much, like, diagrams and nothing too technical. And, like, I loved it. It was mm. great. You know, shows the movement. Yeah. Mm. But the, mm. like, there's not, like, a little, like, middle section where it's like, let's try this on one note. Let's try taking a deep <laughs> breath. Let's try taking a fast breath but keeping the... the no, it's just for a... <laughs> Just for a fantasy, boom. right for away. A fantasy. So, yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was um, interesting, an okay. interesting choice. But yes, I had I had qualms. I had I had issue with the uh, <laughs> like super beginner foray, and then like I mean, I, I, it's everything he says in there is really good. Just like the level at mm. which it's approached was a little mm. like I mean, maybe I just didn't read it correctly. But, um, but yes, that sums up my week one. Uh, sorry, it was a little uh, lengthy, uh, but uh, yes, there was a lot to cover. But, um, but yes, Jen, how was your week one practicing books four and five? <laughs> yes. Well, like you, I was um, engrossed in the many, many informations at the beginning of mm. the breathing. Uh, no, not the breathing. The vibrato and intonation uh, book. Um, mm-hmm. What really struck to me, so... <laughs> I'm going to say it right now. I I, yes, I, go for it. I don't really get into the science, so I was just skimmed <laughs> that. And I got to the bits where, where um, the practical the practicalities. Um, mm-hmm. So, for example, I loved his little section on tuning up. And um, he oh, writes yeah. these three mm-hmm. scenarios about here are three young students and um, – they're going to tune up to the piano, see if you can oh, identify yourself that, yeah. in, in these three examples. And the first one's got like the piano plays the tuning note and then the flute player immediately blots it out, coughs loudly, and then starts playing completely out of tune. Um, so there's these three kind of versions <laughs> of tuning up and you're supposed to identify with which one was you when you were young. And I have to say, I was probably the, I think I was number two, the timid one, because I definitely remember like I play a very small little A going, oh no, I don't think it's in tune, like, because you're supposed to be playing in tune uh, when you're tuning up. Aww. But the yeah. whole point of the exercise, although interestingly, he does say, you know, everyone's got to tune up. Um, with the piano but I remember like I don't know if you got this too in uni but there were all these discussions about when you were tuning up for auditions and competitions that actually it was the first note which the audition panel heard yes. so it had to be yes. really good and in tune yeah. and you're sitting there going holy cow this yeah I feel like it's become this whole thing right the, the, yeah, the that... first tuning note it's been put up on a pedestal and this thing that was initially supposed to just help you play better in tune is now like a whole like you must play this first note oh like oh, yeah, yeah perfectly mm-hmm. in tune or else they're just going to assume that you're horrendously sharp or flat the whole way through and you're, oh my gosh you're just anyway. gonna go onto the stage play the a and they're gonna go thank you and you're like no please give me another so, go exactly. i coughed so much anxiety immediately mm-hmm. um but what i really like he's like he says most often, often the performer cannot hear the pitch easily and the feeling that he ought to be able to tries to cover inadequacy and he's just like, tuning up is not easy. Yeah, I just really liked it because um, it <laughs> it, it's, it's so, it's it's so relatable because in mm-hmm. some ways tuning up is the most, <laughs> it's 
the most anxious moment of the whole concert. It's the worst part. Well, yeah, you're like, like the rest of it, you're, you're performing, like, right? And yeah. this is the only section where it's like a question being it's asked to you in front of an audience of like a hundred or, or however many people are at your recital, exactly. and you have, and they all know if you answered it right or wrong, even if they don't have a degree in music, because everyone can yeah. tell if it doesn't sound the same. So. You're just like, well, I don't think that's quite right. Exactly. It's like the, but it goes to show that. Actually, yes, this is something that I can practice ready for uh, the occasion. I'm just like, actually, that's true. I don't practice tuning to the piano a huge amount. Um, So something I could do more. It would probably, like, improve Mm -hmm. everything amazingly. But anyway, it's um, I really (laughs) liked that. And the other section I liked in his much talkiness uh, writing um, was – uh, when he starts talking about vibrato and particularly um, the idea of how it's changed in historical context over I the years. I loved that too. I yeah, because it's that's really changed in style. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like 18th century vibrato was kind of seen as an ornamentation, so only really used on long notes. And 19th century was really just used for like high points of the phrase. And, um, mm-hmm. and he says string players study vibrato in great detail. And I have to completely agree because I've probably got most of my information about good taste in vibrato from watching um, those mixed master classes that we would have at uni and when the oh, string yeah. when like a mm-hmm. string player was taking them and talking to a string player. Like the amount of the amount of um, focus they put on discussing tone colours and vibrato is is just on another level and mm-hmm. um i just found it fascinating cuz i thought yeah we we really don't talk about it so much in flute yeah uh, yeah so absolutely. i found that very very interesting and um he says at the end flute playing is always on the move and the changes in style and uh, and tone are more obvious examples of changing taste. And he reckons in the next 50 years, one of the changes that sh- must surely come is the control and dampening down of vibrato. Mm. So he says today it's overused. It's like, whew. oh, well, when was this Ooh. written again? Because I would say yes, like especially in happened. the 90s, it yep. was overused. But I would and say today, at least from all the master classes that I go to and observe or participate in, I think it's, it's very toned much, down. yeah, yeah, it's yeah, very toned. Like it's more akin to what it was like in Baroque era, and the, and some mm. of those like where it's like used as more of an ornament, like not mm. so ornamental as in like very stark differences mm. between like mm. like where it sounds more nanny goat like. <laughs> But yeah. used as, <laughs> you know, you don't hear it on every single note nowadays. It's very mm. much like used to bring out a line a little bit yeah. more. Do you see like when that fir- that book was first released in yours? Um, I've got like 1983. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I would so say I that, that, yeah. I think that would be bang on. Yeah. I think Trevor Y was absolutely right. And now we can look forward and say that, yeah, the vibrato used in the 80s. And the 90s was definitely heavier mm. than what we use today. <laughs> oh, man. I was like, it resonated. <laughs> so that was um, my, and of course, then I played my scales this week Perfect. as well. Um, but actually, again, I was overwhelmed by the amount of <laughs> stuff to practice. Yes. So I <laughs> decided to split it into more manageable chunks. So I kind of focused Perfect. on a, two keys a day. That was my week one. That's enough for week one. That's a lot of thoughts for week I one. I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll talk more about scales I think in my week two um how was your week okay. two my week two let's I know I'm gonna do my best to kind of summarize <laughs> week two um I, most of it was a continuation on what I was doing in week one just adding more onto it so it's mm. week week two I in book four so the intonation and vibrato book so I spent a lot of time with the intonation side in week yeah. one I would say with lots of reading doing the trios and everything then yeah. in week two, I continued um, onwards uh, with the book more along the vibrato side and his like mm. extra little sections. You know how I always like to mention how he has these sections that are kind of non-related. This one is mm. related, though. He talks about perfect pitch, which I thought was oh, also interesting because I'm sure yes. that was one thing that intimidated me as a little 
kid, they would be like, mm. oh, this this player, she has perfect pitch. And I was like, mm. what does that mean? <laughs> but yeah, I like that they talk about even if you have perfect pitch, you know, you still have to work on things. And it kind of also describes, you know, the difference between perfect pitch and absolute pitch and how everyone can kind of adjust with absolute mm. pitch. Like for me, I always have a, a, a B natural in my head that I can oh, usually wow. use that as a reference note for the rest of my things. And again, this is like <laughs> where he talks about how you have to exercise your ear. For me, like yeah. in aud- audition season, it's perfect. Like I've got it. It's on. I can tell the difference. But when it's <laughs> like if I'm just yeah. doing like regular practice and I'm kind of like slacking a little bit, it's harder. And sometimes I'm sharper flat or like <laughs> half a tone flat. So, um, but yeah, I thought that was great he has a nice little thing i love that you talk about like carry around a tuning fork and practice comparing everyday sounds with it so um because yeah i don't think we see enough tuning forks nowadays or maybe i just need to be in choir more (laughs) (laughs) just don't see it too much um but yeah so i thought that was a nice little i remember reading that in week two and getting a little chuckle out of that and then i finally dived into the vibrato bit that he discusses which yeah Mm. like you were saying i think Mm, vibrato production we don't like we discuss Mm. on the flute but it's more like don't be a nanny goat don't be this or like do it like this they should be like i remember in one of the books i used as a while i was growing up they would show the waves like if you imagined your vibrato like waves and then making sure that your waves so you know very gentle or Mm. making sure that they're if they were choppy it was deliberate Mm. but you really Mm. didn't want choppy ones because it doesn't sound so nice but yeah, I liked how he gave a bunch of little exercises you could do to create mm. different techniques on there. So I thought that was great mm. to have like it kind of broken down. Then I saw the waves and he breaks it down into stages, um, <laughs> which I thought was great. You know, I love a stage. And that he, <laughs> but yeah, see, like compared to the breathing, he starts this with very manageable pieces, you know, mm. like he starts off on whole notes. Then he breaks yeah. it down into like nice eight, yeah, like eight bar phrases of music so that way you have like a nice little turn of phrase not just for a fantasy <laughs> so for week two i played through the 24 studies for intonation which i thought were lovely again mm, nice mm. simple starting basic you know like and that way you can really focus on the task at hand which is not technique or you know scales I tried to do four a day so i could get through Ooh. all 24 wow. in a week because I really wanted to get to the next section before yeah, the no, end, exactly. which was <laughs> <laughs> the examples of intonation problems in musical works, a.k.a. every single orchestral uh, excerpt known yes. to man, which I thought that was great yeah. because it yeah, you just starts it immediately because that's you have the problem in auditions. It's intonation or vibrato. So it's basically this book. That is the majority yeah. of comments that people get, I think, nowadays. Like once you're at a certain level, technique, I think, tone and like scalar consistency is quite yeah. solid. It's these little things that can be that are so easily affected by surroundings Mm. And so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I like that he had that whole list. So I did choose a couple to work on, uh, <laughs> um, which I thought. Um, so, yeah, his, uh, which one was it? The Shostakovich Symphony Number no. 10, that first mm. movement, the two piccolo yeah. bits, which, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then also that he mentions the um, Debussy, La Mer, and not La Premiere. I thought mm. that was interesting. So, mm. But then he also says it's like, you know, the long solo with the oboe, which then you would want to be checking your intonation with the oboe and anyone who's done yeah. an audition before. That's yeah. what they always love. You know, they're like, oh, if you're doing the Carmen Entre act, the la, da, 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 da. You know, Hmm. you have to make sure you know when the clarinet enters and that you are Hmm. able to show through your playing that you are listening (laughs) to the clarinet. So, yeah, it's uh, (laughs) so yeah, I like that he puts often the instruments that you're playing with and who you need to be listening to. I think that would be super helpful as someone approaching these for the first time. Like, here's what you need to tune to. Maybe look at how they tune and what their tendencies are so you could adjust for that and show that in your performance. So, yeah, anyways. So yeah, 
Loved it. Thought it was cool. And yes, uh, it gave me a whole new playlist to make as well of music to Yay. listen to. <laughs> <laughs> In book five, the just all the scales kind of working on breathing, making my lungs, you know, see how far they can expand mm. and doing just the basic expressive and technical scales and arpeggios. Whereas mm. in week two of book five, I mm. did, a, I continued on that, but did a little less and focused a little more on the scales and thirds and the broken arpeggios, oh, which yeah, okay. was fun. I love, I love broken scales and thirds and broken arpeggios. I could play those all day. They're just... And especially if you don't have to articulate, you can just let the air control, like your air, like lead you through. Mm. It's just, it's, it's quite relaxing, I find. Um, and I liked his arpeggios. They're basically the moist exercises again. Oh, that's, <laughs> yes, that's what I was going to say. It was like, gave me flashbacks to the uh -huh. daily, moist daily exercises. Yeah, Holy exactly. So yeah. just how he writes them, he gives you the initial scale um, mm -hmm. and then instead of rewriting it, he just says, OK, but now basically like flat the fifth or yeah. flat the third do, or do raise it on the, the first. All in these cases. <laughs> yeah, Go. exactly. Which I mean, because it's easy because then if you're uh, if you have a little bit of experience with music, it's easy to just look at that. Be like, oh, that's the key we're playing in. And then the mm -hmm. pattern stays the same. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. totally what Moise does as well. Mm -hmm. So I have to say I'm not super into improvisation. So I did not do much with that section. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, but I did like that he quoted a uh, Quance in there about uh, improvisation. That was mm. one thing I thought, like, oh, that's kind of nice. So nice little nugget to mention um but yeah and that's how i ended my week too so oh, wow. lots of stuff but um lots of stuff. yeah loving the orchestral excerpts those were those were a lot of fun jen how was your week too my week too so yes i continued with my intonation kind of i used them as a warm-up a little bit um oh, to yeah. get kind of my mm -hmm. ear in um it was funny when you were talking about having this kind of relative pitch, perfect pitch. I, I don't think I've actually got, well, I'm not aware of a note in my head, but if a note plays, then if I have the mm -hmm. flute, I generally, like I just play a note and it's generally the note that's playing. It's weird. It's like Ooh. I've associated the pitch with the fingers, with the physical movement now. Oh, like yeah. Like I've got enough uh -huh. of that. But if, if, you tried, <laughs> if I tried it on any other instrument, complete chaos but I think I've been playing the flute so long I've kind of developed a I don't know a, a physical if I think too much about it it's wrong if I just do mm -hmm. it it's right it's very <laughs> it's like I get in my own way which actually um yeah. I thought connected really well with his um playing from memory which he's got down mm. the back of this after oh, the yes. improvisation bit which you didn't like which is fair enough um <laughs> but playing from memory and he says mm -hmm. often trying hard to get it right is what stands in the way of a reliable memory. And I thought, mm. yes, actually, yeah, yeah. I think often that's correct because the few times I've had to play for mem from memory, I really, I didn't grow up playing from memory as a kid when it was, it wasn't part of my normal yeah. um, performance experience or practice. So I came into it quite late. So I, I, I never feel comfortable, um, playing without music of course to play it well you basically got it from memory but when it comes to being in a pressure situation <laughs> the mm. music's got to be somewhere in my vicinity <laughs> yeah even if it's yeah, really yeah. far away I need to be able to know it's there it's he, he's got some tips for playing from memory and and the thing that struck me was that basically it's do everything in small steps. Like don't immediately, don't try and immediately play an entire Bach uh, sonata from memory as your first experience mm -hmm. <laughs> performing. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. have the music there, but just get used to the idea of um, looking up while you're playing and don't like, what does he use? He uses this great phrase, don't stare at the music all the time like a rabbit at a snake and just using like this idea of memorizing your technique your technical work and stuff like that so I use that on um, these scale patterns um you know I did a bit of walking around mm -hmm. I wandered into my kitchen which is attached to my <laughs> living room so therefore three steps away I live in a small apartment um so it wasn't that far but still I was moving away and I had a nice look out the window while I was practicing and you know I was you know roaming around I got a lot more uh, 
into a wandering spirit as I practice my technical work, just to, especially the ones which, um, Mm -hmm. you know, ones which uh, are a little bit less familiar, such as what were those diminished, uh, the broken, the broken seventh chords. That was a lot of fun. And that was kind of how I approached my technical work. Um, as, as I did in week one, I kind of was just working on two different keys, um, every Mm -hmm. key signatures, um, every day and did all of the scales in that plus the chromatics and whole tones, um, just to try and, so I could spend a bit yeah. more time on them and um, really, because uh, especially with like scales and thirds and all those um, broken arpeggios, like I like I like spending a bit more time on them because, I mean, they, invo- they involve so much finger coordination and particularly when you're getting to mm. the high register and having to switch like that heinous F to A, like seriously, my nemesis. Ooh, yes. um, like, uh, you know, it's just, it's nice to be able to spend a bit more time on that and really slow it down and make sure it's clean and yeah all working fine Mm -hmm. and relaxed and yeah so I really enjoy that but yes as you said serious Moyes flashbacks there is a lot of material to get through and they're they're full range they're like really Mm -hmm. like it's a hefty workout to get through even (laughs) just two (laughs) two uh, key signatures of all of the scales which he mentions in this so yeah and I liked how he pointed that out at the end of the scale section that um, before you launch into the scales and thirds, it's like you've you've learned 95 of 90 percent of the entire flute repertoire by learning these patterns because they appear mm. all the time in music. So that's why we practice them. They keep our technique good. And also they just make learning music faster and more fun because <laughs> um, we've done all the hard work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh and we can just make music then. Hooray. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that was that was really my highlights of my week two. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, so Jen, <laughs> what would you say your verdict was for mm. books four and five books four of and Trevor Wise? Mm-hmm. I'll split them into two. Book four with the mm-hmm. uh, intonation and vibrato. I thought this was really accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, and very good um, for all ages of flute player. Um, The vibrato probably is most useful for people just starting out with a vibrato or wanting to maybe maybe occasionally brush up their technique with vibrato Mm -hmm. just to make sure it's all working well and, you know, you haven't developed any strange habits. Um, the the intonation's great. I mean, who doesn't need to practice intonation? And these, particularly as you practice them in low register and high register, I think cover the big problems of playing in these keys and, and help you kind of get your ear in and aware of mm-hmm. um, what what to watch out for. Um, also, highly recommend them on the piccolo as well when the range permits. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> um, so it did a bit of that. And also on the alto flute. In fact, they're just great for all the flutes. So just, um, oh, you yeah. know, if you want to do a bit of intonation practice, applicable to all, <laughs> very versatile. You mentioned this before that the breathing and scales seemed very, very hard. Like with the musical yes. example given of foray where it's quite, mm-hmm. like you're getting into quite... Um, complex and advanced ideas of phrasing and then just the 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 technical um the technical requirements to be able to play these scales um like makes me (laughs) makes me think that this is more aimed at someone who has a more of a grasp on the full range of the flute um so we're probably not looking at beginners this is pretty intense scales yeah, so that's my verdict. I'd say one accessible for all. Book five, you're probably wanting a really good handle on the second book of technique before you roll mm-hmm. into this. Oh, that's one. a good way to put it. That's yeah. that's my verdict. But I mean, so much great detail. Again, he's got all these pointers, and it's just like this mm-hmm. treasure trove of information which you could just spend weeks <laughs> and weeks unpacking and exploring. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's yeah. my verdict. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my verdict. Okay. Uh, it might sound quite similar to yours, Jen. <laughs> but yes, I think book four is very accessible for beginners and introducing these themes of con, like these concepts and themes of intonation and how to implement 
practicing them into your daily practice at a nice beginning level and then increasing with difficulty. So very much like how his tone book and his tone book kind of introduces these concepts very easily and then, you know, gives you with each section like a little more advanced ways to think Mm. of it. So, Mm. yeah, totally agree with that. Absolutely. Um, And also with vibrato, um, I thought that also it was really great how he discusses vibrato and it gives you nice a nice little way to approach it. I mm. think if you're an, a more intermediate or advanced player, you can easily adapt it to these like ideas into your practicing as well to mm. make a cohesive exercise out of it. Book five. Yes. Um, <laughs> see, I'm really conflicted about book five because there's mm. so many great nuggets of wisdom that I think learned at an early age for example his approach to memory work like you were discussing that could be started at a very early age like at a beginner level also Mm -hmm. like introducing this idea of improvisation early to like help the beginners kind of get used to improvising and not have like a stigma around it I think Mm. is great but then you have like his approach to breathing in the scales which is definitely like you said Jen more immediate intermediate to advanced for sure Mm. so I'm torn on book five. If you decide to approach book five, just make sure that it's, you know, very, like, I would just keep that in mind that if you're a beginner and you are looking into practicing book five, some of it's going to be hard and just supplement kind of like what Jen was saying. Start with book two when it comes to technique, start with those easier Mm. scale patterns Mm. and everything. And then once you get comfortable with that, hop back over to book five and then to like keep advancing your scales and um, like range of like arpeggios, thirds, etc. There's whole scales in there as well. Chromatics. There's yeah. the, it runs the lot. So Everything. that would be my verdict for <laughs> book five. Great. Kind of a mixed bag for me of like levels of <laughs> uh, players abilities. But um, yeah. yeah, that's a, yeah, my, my verdict. And then Fantastic. I think Jen, that might be the, uh, the end of our episode. Woo-hoo. Yeah. What a, what a fortnight. <laughs> Holy moly. No, there was, <laughs> there was a lot of practicing and a lot of reading. But yes, uh, thank you listeners for listening uh, to us today and tuning in. We really appreciate all of your support, especially everyone over on YouTube as well. Um, So the Practice Odyssey can be found on all podcast platforms. If you have found one we are not on, please let us know. Uh, You can also write to us and let us know what you think. Uh, Our email address is thepracticeodyssey at gmail.com. Uh, You can also leave us a rating or comment on Apple Podcasts that helps other like-minded musicians or practicers find this podcast and maybe also get some help from it. You can also subscribe to you on YouTube uh, by searching for the Practice Odyssey podcast. Please go check out our new banner on our homepage, redesigned this past week by yours truly. Mm. Uh, music in this episode is from Alessandra Woods, and the show art is from Ivan Potter Smith. Listeners, thanks again for tuning in. We will see you in another fortnight to discuss book six, Advanced Practicing Good or Advanced best. Practice. <laughs> Ooh, man. Until then, have a great week and we'll see you then. Take care. Bye. Bye.